loving and most gracious heavenly father we praise you and thank you for this evening thank you for bringing us all together thank you for teaching us your word father thank you for taking us through all these glorious truths of romans all these all these weeks god father we pray that you would uh be with us as you have promised lord and enlighten our hearts and minds as we as we wrap up romans 11 lord help us see more of you more of your glory give us a heart of worship and a heart of obedience lord come at all of us who have gathered here and all of your children who are going to watch and listen to the study in the coming days lord all for your glory in jesus name we pray amen welcome again yes we have uh, come to an end of a lot of things first of all we have come to the end of a of a glorious chapter romans chapter 11 that describes god's faithfulness to his to his promises to his covenant second we have come to the end of a section romans 9 10 11 that deals with uh, the relationship of a believer uh, to israel as a nation and also god's uh, we have learned through it uh, through the through the whole process we have learned god's sovereign mercy and grace and more importantly uh, we have come to the end of the first half the the theological uh, the doctrinal half and not theological that's not the right word the doctrinal half of uh, the book of romans chapter 1 to chapter 11 chapter 12 to chapter 15 uh, is how do we live based on this and 16 is paul's personal uh, comments so we are wrapping up uh, today a big uh, a, and we have reached a, a big landmark i would say and personally it was very exciting for me uh the very fact that we reached here you know it's it's i praise god and gives me much joy so coming back to the big question of romans 11 what was that has god rejected his people has god rejected his people and paul says no by no means absolutely not and paul explains it threefold explanation one the present rejection is uh, only partial god always has a remnant i am an example paul is saying the second the present rejection is purposeful god has a purpose behind all of that and third the present rejection is passing it is not permanent it is only passing so that was paul's explanation and that was romans 11 the 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 overview of romans 11 before going to today's uh, text that is verse 25 to 36 um i want us to go through a few aspects that which we couldn't uh, discuss last week and before that let's uh, read our text for today romans 11 was 25 to 36 and after that we'll read a couple of other verses from the from from uh preceding verses romans 11 25 to 36 lest you would be wise in your own sight i do not want you to be unaware of this mystery brothers a partial hardening has come upon israel until the fullness of the gentiles have come in and in this way all israel will be saved as it is written the deliverer will come from zion he will banish ungodliness from jacob and this will be my covenant with them when i take away their sins as regards the gospel they are enemies for your sake but as regard election they are beloved for the sake of their four fathers for the gift and the calling of god are irrevocable was 30 for just as you were at one time disobedient to god but now have received mercy because of their disobedience so they too have now been disobedient in order that by the mercy shown to you 
they also may now receive mercy for god has consigned all to disobedience that he may have mercy on all oh the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of god how unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways for who has known the mind of the lord or who has been his counselor or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid for from him and through him and to him are all things to him be glory forever amen romans 11 verse 25 to 26 36 that's today's text and before going to that let's read was 20 to 22 because we need to go into certain very important aspects which we couldn't discuss last week verse 20 that is true they were broken off because of their unbelief this is paul talking to the gentiles about the present condition of israel and god's purpose and future plans with what he is doing and Paul's warning that is true they were broken off because of their unbelief but you stand fast through faith so do not become proud but fear for if god did not spare the natural branches neither will he spare you note then the kindness and the severity of god severity towards those who have fallen but god's kindness to you provided you continue in his kindness otherwise you too will be cut off let me read it again that is true they were broken off because of their unbelief but you stand fast through faith so do not become proud but fear for if god did not spare the natural branches neither will he spare you note then the kindness and the severity of god severity towards those who have fallen but kindness to you provided you continue in his kindness otherwise you too will be cut off i hope you you were following the text here paul is uh, describing a few things pointing out a few things first of all this is a warning to the gentiles i th- if i remember right right from verse 13 paul is addressing the gentiles so the the essence is behold the kindness and severity of god what does paul mean by this and how can we apply this in our life that is what we want to learn um, at the outset so paul is saying gentiles you should not be arrogant towards the broken branches the fallen jews do not be arrogant that's the first point second thing that paul is teaching here is gentiles remember you stand fast through faith you are standing fast you are now connected and attached and you remain attached to this covenant tree through faith and so do not become proud but fear remember do not become proud rather fear and finally continue in god's kindness these are the the phrases of the or the text that i want uh, you to keep in in your mind so uh, the essence of what paul is saying here is this brothers your your life your salvation your remaining in the in the covenant tree all depends on your faith not just simple faith your persevering faith your faith at last your faith that remains your faithfulness till the end your life your salvation your remaining uh, in this tree everything your eternal security is connected to your persevering in faith that's the first thing and paul says a godly fear is essential to remain in faith if you want to remain faithful till the end if you want to be steadfast in faith if you want to continue in his kindness you need to have a godly fear that is integral to your faith 
and paul says the key to such a life is beholding the severity and the kindness of god i want you to get that connection first your life your salvation your your remaining in this this covenant tree depends on your persevering in faith your you remaining in faith you continuing in faith and a godly fear is essential for this remaining in faith that's what philippians 2 says 212 with fear and trembling work out your salvation with fear and trembling philippians 212 and the key to such a life paul says is beholding the kindness and severity of god let's let's try to uh, dig in into that you know these two aspects the severity and the kindness of god when you look into the scripture very often it is placed side by side and you cannot separate that this is very 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 important for us to understand because a, a right true understanding of god and his attributes is essential because if we have a unilateral understanding of god a skewed understanding of god then we will over time create in our hearts and minds a god of our own imagination who who would who who over time would have nothing to do with the god of the bible that's why paul is saying behold look continually look into the severity and kindness of god uh, let's look into a few 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 scriptures exodus 34 Verse six: The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, "The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty." visiting the iniquity of the fathers on children and the children's children to the third and the fourth generation have you noticed the kindness and the severity of god placed side by side matthew 10 verse 28 to 31 and do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul rather fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell who is that who can destroy both soul and body in hell it is not satan it is god because in hell you are not under satan's wrath a sinner an unrepentant repenting sinner in hell is under god's wrath so fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell are not two sparrows sold for a penny and not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father but even the hairs of your head are all numbered fear not therefore you are of much more value than many sparrows verse 28 describing the severity of god the holiness of god the judgment of god and says fear him and verse 31 says fear not behold the severity and kindness of god romans 2 again or do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience not knowing that god's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance but because of your hard and impenitent heart you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when god's righteous judgment will be revealed the kindness and severity of god how do we apply this you know verse 22 doesn't say that the call for us is not to continue in the severity of god but the call the end is to continue in the kindness of god so how do we understand this so the purpose of looking beholding looking at the severity of god is that we would continue in the kindness of god we would continue in faith we would be steadfast in faith we would remain faithful till the end that's the purpose of looking at the severity of god you know we should behold the holiness of god the righteousness of god the justice of god his judgments 
his word with all the warnings behold all of that and flee to his loving kindness that's what we have to do behold the severity of god and flee to his kindness flee to his mercy and his grace and this keeps us always in faith this keeps us away from unbelief this this pulls us away from sin and this helps us in our sanctification and that is what paul is teaching here and unlike a sinner this fear this is a godly fear the difference is for a sinner the severity of god has attached to it condemnation and the wrath of god but for us the children of god in christ there is now no condemnation romans 8:1 so this this fear is mixed with joy and delight and it's it's a godly fear let's uh look into a few verses nehemiah was chapter 1 was 11 i don't think it is there in our text let me try to bring it on to the screen nehemiah chapter 1 was 11 those who have your bibles please open your bibles it says o lord let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight to fear your name so nehemiah chapter 1 verse 11 talks about god's servants who delight to fear in god's name your servants who delight to fear your name similarly isaiah uh, chapter 11 verse 3 isaiah chapter 11 verse 3 and his delight shall be in the fear of the lord his delight shall be in the fear of the lord god's children delights in the fear of the lord and this is what paul is talking about and this is very much essential a continual balanced a rightful look into the severity and the kindness of god is essential for a life of steadfast faith and that is the true christian life and the the scripture talks about persevering in faith steadfast faith and that leads us to a very very important doctrine which theologians call the doctrine of perseverance of the saints or the doctrine of the preservation of the saints traditionally it's called the doctrine of perseverance of the saints but it is uh it's not different it's uh, those are the two sides of the same coin perseverance of the saints and preservation of the saints let me let me uh, define this doctrine all those who are born of god all of god's true children all those who are regenerated will be preserved by god and they will persevere till the end of their life all those who are born again all those who are born of god all those who are regenerated all those who are justified we know by the golden chain will be glorified how they are not glorified just like that living the life they want they are glorified because god preserves them and as a result they persevere in their faith and only those who persevere till the end in faith have been truly regenerated it doesn't say only those who persevere till the end will be finally regenerated in the end no all those who are truly regenerated will persevere till the end that's why perseverance in faith is critical and absolutely important all those who are true children of god they are kept by god from the heavenly perspective they are kept by god god's power we have learned that as we learned romans 8 the work of the holy spirit and from the earthly perspective 
they will persevere till the end, till the last breath, they will keep their faith by God's power. So I'm not going to the details or the verses that describe this doctrine, but I want to touch it and that is very important. So coming to uh, today's text, verse 25 to 29, let's, uh, let's read verse 25 to 29. Lest you be wise in your own sight, I do not want you to be unaware of this mystery, brothers. A partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of Gentiles have come in. And in this way, all Israel will be saved. As it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion. He will banish ungodliness from Jacob. And this will be my covenant with them when I take away their sins. As regards the gospel, they are enemies for your sake. But as regard election, regards election, they are beloved for the sake of their forefathers. For the gift and the calling of God are irrevocable. Verse 25 to 29. This is one section where Paul is bringing in emphatically one point, one truth. That is, all Israel will be saved. It doesn't mean every individual Israel who ever lived on planet Earth will be saved. No. It means in, some, in the future, in some future generation, the entire nation of Israel, Israel as an ethnic group, Israel as a nation, will come to Christ in faith, will come to their Redeemer in faith. Let's look uh, into the section verse by verse. Verse 25 talks about a partial hardening. A partial hardening has come upon Israel. So it's very clear Paul's argument. The main question, has God rejected his people? No. The present hardening, the present condition, the present rejection, the present unbelief is passing. It is partial. It is not once for all. It is not forever. God has not rejected Israel forever. It is a partial hardening. That's the first truth. And the verse also says, the word until, it lasts until the full number of the Gentiles have come in. So God has a purpose in all of this and God has specifically ordained history accordingly. And can, can't we see the sovereignty of God? You, know, you don't need a more clearer verse there. Until the full number of Gentiles, until all of God's elect, Gentile elect, come to God, are called effectively by God. All those whom God foreknew, He chose, called, justified, and they'll be glorified. Coming back to verse 25, this partial hardening will last until the full number of the Gentiles will come in. That's what Paul is teaching here. Verse 26 and 27. Paul is bringing in something, something else there. That's not very explicit there, but it is very clearly uh, implicit there. You need to realize both the Gentiles and the Jews and Israel, the Gentiles and Israel, both have the same way of salvation. That's We should never go wrong here because there are a lot of well-meaning uh, Christians and churches who have wrongly understood uh, this aspect. The Israel in this future generation are going to be saved by the same deliverer from Zion who have saved the Gentiles. Look into that usage of being saved, uh, you know, sin being taken away. These are all, it talks about justification through faith in Jesus Christ. And remember, there is one Savior. The Savior is the same. There is one covenant. The covenant is the same. There is only one olive tree. There is only one olive tree into which uh, both the Jews and the Gentiles are, are grafted in. As we have discussed last week, the old covenant is not replaced by the new covenant. The new covenant is the fulfillment of the old covenant. So, you know, people have gone wrong here because I know people who, who, who believe and teach that uh, Gentiles have a different way of salvation than the Jews. In other words, the Jews need not 
trust Jesus Christ. The Jews did, need not believe in the gospel to be saved. God has a different plan for them. That is not biblical. And this has majorly come up after the Holocaust when churches uh, began to believe that sharing the gospel and evangelizing the Jews uh, is anti-Semitism, which is absurd, which is actually cruelty to the Jews. So both the Gentiles and Israel have the same way of salvation. Again, another point that we understand from these two verses, the certainty of the, uh, of the future salvation of Israel. Israel will be saved. Look into verse 29. Irrevocable. The promises of God, the call of God. You can't change it. So thus, it is a certainty that God will have his people. And finally, let's uh, uh, also focus on, on the phrase, uh, all Israel. What does it mean by all Israel? Now, some people uh, take it to, to mean uh, the all, all of the spiritual Israel, you know, both the Gentiles and the Jews, the true believers. No, that is not what is being talked about here. I'll, I'll explain why. Some people think of this as the sum total of the remnants in each generation. The remnant that we have talked about in the beginning at the beginning of this chapter. No, that is not what Paul is mentioning here because uh, it is clear from the context that Paul is talking about the nation Israel, Israel as an ethnic group, because the word Jacob, the use of the word Jacob, that hints uh, that the the uh, it is the nation that is in Paul's mind. Second, the context of verse 25 and 26 makes it clear. The usage is similar in verse 12 and verse 15. Uh, we are not going into that, uh, all of the details of that. But in all of these verses, it is clear the con from the context that it is the nation of Israel. So all of Israel will be saved means all of Israel in a future generation. The word will be saved uh, when they uh, will be saved. All indicates a future uh, reality. So verse 25 to 29, Paul says all of Israel will be saved. Paul answers the first question. Has God rejected his people? No. Paul has very well explained his case. Now moving on, verse 30, 31 and 32. For just as you were at one time disobedient to God, but now have received mercy because of their disobedience, for God has consigned all to disobedience that he may have mercy on all. What does this portion say? These three verses, 30, 31, and 32, talk, describe the, the design of history, God's design of history. Now, there is a time of Gentile disobedience. There is a time of Jewish disobedience. There is a time of mercy to the Gentiles. And there will be a time of mercy to Israel. The grand design of history. And verse 32 sums up all of it. The purpose of God behind this design. It is to magnify the glory of his grace and mercy. God has consigned all to disobedience so that his mercy would be glorified. To cut the pride of the Jews, he ordained them into disobedience. To cut the pride of Gentiles, we can see, we have already seen Paul's warning to the Gentiles, do not be proud, but rather fear God. Because the very reason you are there is not because of your work or merit, but because of faith. Stand firm in that faith. Stand, continue in God's kindness. So the purpose is the glory of is to, is to magnify the greatness of his mercy. As, as we have seen in Romans 9.16, I think we need to read that verse again. So then it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. Sovereign, faithful mercy. Let's pull back the lens a little bit, looking 
back to Romans 9, 10, 11, we have learned a lot of details, but two very important truths are glaring here. Two important attributes of God are, are being taught by Paul here. One is the sovereignty of God. God has the power to do what he wills to do. God has the, the absolute power to do what he wills to do. God can do everything that he wills according to his character. That is God's sovereignty. The second attribute that we see, especially in Romans chapter 11, is God's integrity. A God who is faithful to his promises. A covenant-keeping God. Not only a covenant-making God, a covenant-keeping God. I want uh, all of us to understand the importance of each one. You know, our, our God can not only, a God not only can save, but he, he will save. He not only can save, but he is willing to save and he will save. Because sovereignty of God alone is not sufficient. God can do, can save us, but what if he is not willing to save us? And faithfulness of God alone is not sufficient. God wants to, God gave us promise and he wants to save us, but he cannot save us. He, has, he doesn't have the power to do that. But the God we serve is not only a God who can save us utterly, absolutely. But he's a God who will save us. Praise God. And Paul is breaking out into this praise song, his doxology verse 33 to 36. Uh, let me request all of you to learn uh, this by heart. And I'm requesting myself also. Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been his counselor? Or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. Let me read it again. Oh, the depth of the riches of God. Oh, the depth of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor or who has given a gift to him that he may be repaid. For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. As Paul closes his, his doctrinal section of his letter, he breaks out into this glorious doxology. He's breaking out into a song. Let's, let's cut it, go deep into it, and let's soak ourselves in it. And in the process, let's be so, let us all be moved in our hearts into worship. That is the one thing that has to happen tonight as we as we listen to God. God's word. Verse 33. Oh, the depth of the riches, wisdom, and knowledge of God. Oh, the depth of God's riches, wisdom, and knowledge. The word oh, the usage oh, what does it indicate? It indicates Paul's, you know, it's Paul's expression to describe something which he cannot express. Something that is indescribable, he is trying to express. Oh, the depth of God. Very, very, very deep it is. That's what Paul is saying. His riches, his wisdom, his knowledge is very, 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 very deep. Unfathomable. In, inexhaustible inconceivable depth of his riches, his wisdom and knowledge. Just one Psalm. Psalm 92 verse 5. How great are your works, O Lord! Your thoughts are very deep. O oh, the depth of God! 
what does the word depth uh, indicate? First of all, it indicates uh, hiddenness. That's what I want you to understand here. It indicates hiddenness. You know, things deep, as you go deep and deep and deep into the ocean, things are not revealed. Things are not easily searchable. Things are deep. So, you know, depth, when, when, when we talk about the depth of God's riches and wisdom and knowledge, definitely it indicates the hiddenness. We need to remember there are profoundly deep and hidden dimensions of God's riches and wisdom and knowledge. Let me repeat, there are profoundly deep and hidden realities, dimensions of God's riches and wisdom and knowledge. We cannot go down there. We need to, we need to, we need to know this as a fact, as a, as a truth. We cannot know there, go, th go there. And, and as children of God, all through eternity, you know, we'll be seeing more and more and more and more of God day by day. And still, we'll never fully, we'll never know him fully because such is the depth of the glory of God. Psalm 139, verse 6. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high, I cannot attain it. Oh, the depth of the knowledge and wisdom and riches of God. Oh, the depth. I want uh, all of us to, I hope you remember the last stanza of the, the hymn, Amazing Grace. It's, it goes like this. When we have been there 10,000 years, talking about eternity, we have, we have spent, say, 10,000 years into eternity, bright shining as the sun. Remember, but we have no less days to sing God's praise than when, when we had first began. You know, let it be 10,000 years, millions of years, we'll have more and more and more of praise. It will be as good as day one. Oh, the depth of God. And secondly, depth indicates reality. Uh, meaning, you know, depth of God's riches, wisdom and knowledge is real. It is not superficial. It is not imaginary. It is not, uh, what do you say? It's not wishful thinking. Only real things have depth and height and weight and breadth. So when we only talk about the depth, of God's attributes. Remember, we are talking about reality. And thirdly, the word depth indicates that it is foundational. You know, I'm, I'm just bringing three aspects of it. Uh, it is foundational. This is more, um, it is beyond expository. This is more of a devotional because I want all of us to worship right now as we, as we learn the scripture right now. The depth of his riches, his wisdom and knowledge is foundational. Because this verse 33 is the foundation for verse 34, 35 and 36. The reason why his judgments are unsearchable, his ways are inscrutable, the reason why no one ha can, can repay God no one can know the mind of the Lord is because God's riches, God's knowledge, God's wisdom is deep. So this is foundational. And remember, God is there at the bottom of all. He's the last, God is the last explanation to all the questions concerning purpose, all the questions concerning meaning, all the questions concerning causality. You ask the why question, you will reach God. You ask the, ask the how question, the when question, the where, whatever question you ask, God is foundation. So, oh, the depth of, of three things Paul is mentioning. The riches of God, the knowledge and wisdom of God. So God's riches, I want to share three aspects regarding this. One, God has made everything 
and so he owns everything i'm not going into those into the verses that describe this this beautiful truth god can do everything according to his holy character and purpose that's the first implication of god's riches everything in the world in the universe every created reality belongs to god second aspect of god's riches when when talking about god's riches the bible talks about the riches of some of god's attributes the riches of his grace the riches of his mercy uh, talks about the unspeakable riches that he provides his children and my thought was going into this verse that talks about christ who who was rich but now has became poor in his incarnation so that we his children would would become rich that we might become rich what a glorious truth and i i want to quote john piper here he says bill gates is a pauper and has nothing compared to the poorest heir of god you take the poorest of all children of god the poorest heir of god and you take bill gates bill gates has nothing compared to that child of god romans 8 we are heirs of god and co-heirs with jesus christ we are going to inherit glory and the third aspect very important when we talk about oh the depth of god's riches we need to remember god himself you know is the richest and the most precious and the most beautiful treasure of the universe yes everything belongs to god we will inherit all of that but the most richest the most beautiful the most precious treasure of the universe is god himself matthew 13 verse 44 the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field which a man found and covered up then in his joy he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field the kingdom of heaven is a kingdom parables in matthew and jesus says the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure of great wealth of great wealth and what is our response when we find that wealth the verse says in his joy he went and sold everything else he sells everything that he has so that he can get hold of this in his joy he was so filled with joy in his heart that he was willing to exchange everything for this great treasure and remember god is this great treasure that we have in christ and that's why matthew 6:21 says where your ha- treasure is there your heart will also be you know in matthew 13 verse 44 this person could know the value and worth of that treasure and his heart was filled with joy he had placed his treasure in the right place so his heart followed and only and if and only and when we learn how to treasure go god beyond every other created reality only then will have will we have our heart in the right place only then we'll be able to exchange everything else we'll be able to sell off every other other so called pleasures and treasures of this world this is the way to sanctification knowing and cherishing and savoring god as the greatest treasure and that is why paul says no god's kindness no god savior to no god and paul in philippians 3 verse 7 and 8 we know the verse says whatever gain i had i count as a loss for the sake of christ why because of the sir passing worth 
he was able to count the gain he knew it is gain you know counting all of this loss is gain why because of the surpassing worth of what i am gaining matthew 16 verse 25 talks about whoever would save his life will lose it and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it jesus is saying this this is a very clear explicit exclusive statement if you are going to run your life to save your life for this world jesus says you are going to lose it and if on the other hand if you are going to if you are willing to sell it off if you are willing to count it all loss if you are willing to lose your life for the sake of christ the greatest treasure the the treasure of surpassing worth then you will find life oh the depth of the riches of god then talks when then paul talks about oh the moving forward oh the depth of god's knowledge and wisdom in general terms uh, what is knowledge and wisdom knowledge is awareness of the facts of reality around us knowledge is the simple awareness of the facts of reality and wisdom is the awareness of how to interpret and analyze and use these facts of reality for the good let me repeat knowledge is simple awareness of facts around us while wisdom is the awareness of how to interpret how to analyze and how to use those facts for the good and paul talks about the depth of god's knowledge and wisdom and this results in the subsequent verses so as a result one how unsearchable are his judgments paul is saying his judgments are profound are deep and always right how unsearchable are his judgments and i want you to understand this you know in a court of law the more information the more knowledge is av- uh, is available and the more wisdom the 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 people there exercise better would be the judgment right the more availability of knowledge and the better use of wisdom the same principle oh the depth of the wisdom and knowledge of god it is so deep so deep that it is unsearchable for human minds oh the depth of god's wisdom and knowledge and as a result how unsearchable are his judgments too as a result his ways are inscrutable it is impossible to understand and interpret god's ways let's not try to do those impossible tasks in 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 our lives as we face life situations rather let's trust god let's worship him three oh the depth of god's wisdom and as a result no one has known god's mind no one can know god's mind four no one can rightfully be god's counselor very interesting right no one can be god's counselor we need to let's let's pause and apply this in our lives how often do we say oh lord i don't like the way you 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 are running the world right now i don't like the way uh, you are running my life right now i think it should be run this way i think it should be run my way no one can be god's rightful counselor five no one has given anything to god that was not god's in the first place that's the next verse uh, that's my paraphrase of the next verse no one can give god anything god cannot be repaid and this is very important for us to know uh, because this is many people go wrong here let's uh, look into one verse act 17 was 25 talking about god nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything it is god who gives life and breath and everything to all mankind so don't think that 
God is served by human hands as though he needs our anything from us that's what paul is teaching here remember god owns everything everything in our life even our life is a gift from god and as children of god you know all those acts of obedience all those good things that we do in our life is the result of his grace working in us is the result of god serving us not we serving god that's why jesus said i have not come so that i can receive your service i am have come to serve you we cannot serve god we are being served by god and this is and i want to bring into your attention you know again well meaning christians you know use this wrong christian jargon they say god is no debtor to man yes it is right it is scriptural but it the meaning of the scripture is god cannot be a debtor to man but rather at times we use saying oh he has been serving the lord uh, for all these years god is going to pay you back oh let us never ever utter such 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 nonsense god is no debtor to man i have i've heard lot of people using such such statements you know when maybe maybe especially in this context when when men of god uh succumb to the the present pandemic uh, maybe when 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 we hear of certain people certain men of god uh getting covid we say oh he has served the lord so faithfully god will be faithful to him you know god will honor him god will not let him know and paul breaks open into his final word verse 36 for from him and through him and to him are all things all things are from him all things came through him and all things are to him to him be glory forever amen and i want all of us to remember christ jesus the image of the invisible god embodies embodies all of this all of this let's let's look into that and close talking about how christ jesus fulfills this how this worship can be truly and rightfully applied uh, to Christ Jesus Colossians 2 3 in whom talking about Christ in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge in Christ is hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge oh the depth of God's wisdom and knowledge John chapter 1 verse 3 all things were made through him and without him was not anything made that was made talking about the word which became flesh John chapter 1 Christ is the creator of all created reality John chapter 1 Colossians chapter 1 verse 17 Christ sustains all created reality He is before all things and in him all things hold together Finally verse 16 of Colossians chapter 1 For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth visible and invisible whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities all things were created through him and for him by him through him and for him christ jesus the image of the invisible god as piper again says all the created reality exists for the sake of making christ known for the sake of making christ treasured for the sake of making christ loved and it remember this we exist for that all of creation exists for that sake let me close with a few applications one the whole of paul's presentation of of this god's redemptive plan culminates in the glory of god 
you need to remember that chapter one to us chapter one to chapter 11 and chapter 11 ends by the, the whole redemptive plan of god ends by proclaiming to him be glory forever you need to remember the chief end the chief end of of god's plan in salvation is not so much for our salvation not for so much for our sake as it is for the sake of god's glory the chief purpose the chief purpose of god laying down this plan of redemptive plan this plan of salvation is not so much for our salvation but as it is for uh, the glory of god let's uh, let's look into a few verses these are very important i want all of you to give your attention here Psalm 79 verse 9. Help us, O God of our salvation for the glory of your name. Deliver us and atone for our sins for your name's sake. Salvation is for the glory of your name. We are calling out for help for the glory of your name. We need deliverance. We need atonement of our sins for the glory of his name, for your name's sake. Ezekiel verse 20 verse uh, 44, Ezekiel chapter 20. I want all of you to go back and look into this chapter, beautiful chapter. And you shall know that I am the Lord when I deal with you for my name's sake, not according to your evil ways, nor according to your corrupt deeds. O house of Israel, declares the Lord. The Lord is saying, I am not de going to deal with you according to your evil ways. I am not going to condemn you Rather, I'm going to deal with you in salvation, in saving terms for my name's sake. Next verse, Ezekiel, again, 36. Uh, again, the chapter that describes the new covenant. Ezekiel 36, verse 22 to 26, and then verse 32. Also, please go ahead and uh, uh, go home and read the whole chapter. Verse 22, therefore, say to the house of Israel, thus says the Lord God, it is not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I am about to act, but for the sake of my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations to which you came. Remember, God called, called Israel and separated them and set them apart so that they would be a people who would glorify God among the nations. So that God's name would be revered and glorified. God would be known all over the world. But Israel failed. And God says, it is not for your sake that I'm going to save you, but it is for the sake of my holy name. And I will vindicate the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations and which you have profaned among them. And the nations will know that I am the Lord, declares the Lord God. When through you, I vindicate my holiness before their eyes. I, God says, I will vindicate my holiness before their eyes. I will take you from the nations and gather you from all the countries and bring you into your own land. And here comes the new covenant. Verse 25, I will sprinkle clean water on you and you shall be clean from all your uncleanness. And from all your idols, I will cleanse you and I will give you a new heart, a new spirit I will put within you and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And goes and go on and on what God is going to do with them. And finally, God says, it is not for your sake that I will act, declares the Lord God. Let that be known to you. And tonight, let this be known to us. Let our theology be God-centered rather than man-centered. Be ashamed and confounded for your ways, O house of Israel. What we deserve is shame, but rather he gave us mercy. One John two twelve, I am writing to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven, for His name's sake. This is the, the truth of the whole of Scripture, New Testament and the Old Testament alike. That's the first application, and the final uh, application is how go, how Paul has structured the whole uh, of his uh, of his epistle, Romans one chapter one to. Chapter 3, verse 19, we learned how wretched our heart is, both the Jew and the Gentile, and how we are under God's wrath, and how by our works 
we cannot be justified before god roman chapter 3 to 5 paul taught about the work of christ in justifying us and we are justified by faith alone in christ alone apart from works chapter 6 to 8 how god works out the sanctifying process in our lives how uh, god through the holy spirit sanctifies us and our eternal security in christ in romans 8 and romans 9 to 11 god's sovereign grace god's sovereign mercy and god's faithfulness the promise keeping god and what is our response one the most important the primary response is that of awe and worship and praise and wonder i pray that the spirit of god would take us there right now just as paul was singing his doxology oh the depth of the riches of oh the depth of the riches and uh, knowledge and wisdom of god how inscrutable are his ways how unsearchable his judgments and second romans 12 to 15 paul begin to teach us the moral response of this saving work of god and we are going to look into that in the in the coming weeks but before that we need to remember christian morality is not just obedience of a set of of eth- uh, ethical laws but rather christian morality is the is the overflow of a heart of worship this is the overflow of a worshiping heart a heart that has seen god a heart that has seen the severity and the kindness of god a heart that has seen the mercy of god a heart that is overflowing with worship will result in obedience and christian morality is is a fruit that is born out of uh, continually being nourished by this covenant tree the root of this covenant tree christian morality is the fruit of uh, fruit born out of a heart and mind that is that is fully transformed uh, by knowing and savoring the all sufficiency of god in christ jesus when our heart is fully transformed is transformed by by knowing the all sufficiency of god in christ we will sing out in worship and we will live a life of obedience and that's why romans 12 1 and 2 says paul says i appeal to you therefore brothers by the mercies of god i press to present your bodies as a living sacrifice holy and acceptable to god which is your spiritual worship that is the spiritual act of worship yes singing doxology is worship yes but it has to go along with this act of obedience do not be conformed to this world but be transformed by the renewal of your mind that by testing you may discern what is the will of god what is good and acceptable and perfect let's look to the lord in prayer Praise God from whom all blessings flow Praise him all creatures him below Praise him above the heavenly hosts Praise Father Son and Holy Ghost Gracious and loving Father, we praise you, Lord. Thank you for your mercies, Lord. We praise you and worship for who you are. For allowing us to taste and see the depth of your riches and wisdom and knowledge, Lord. Thank you for this beautiful uh, book that you have given us. book of romans lord help us continue to learn it lord help us not stop with romans 11 
rather help us live out romans 1 to 11 in our lives help us live a life of sacrifice of obedience thank you in jesus name we pray amen